Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the NoSillaCast podcast, hosted at podfeed.com, the technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Thursday, August 8th, 2024, and this is show number 1005. This show is coming out early because Steve and I leave on Saturday for our three-week African vacation. We're going to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Botswana. This means there is no live show until September 8th. I'm going to miss all of you terribly till then, and I'm missing you right now because I'm sitting all alone in my studio and nobody's talking to me, nobody's reminding me to save, nobody's telling me to put in chapter marks. It's a, it's a very lonely thing to do, but that's okay. I do want to pre-thank Alistair, Bart, and Jill for the hard work they have coming up. I've written elaborate guides for them using Folga that lets them walk uh, through step-by-step instructions of setting up all the tools that make the show go. I even wrote a readme file to guide them through the guides. I shared passwords with them via 1Password. They've tested the instructions. They're even planning out their content for the most part. We've got three audio and text donations, four if you count the two-parter George from Tulsa sent over, so they even have a little bit of help with content as well. I'm sure the shows will be absolutely terrific, and I hope you give them lots of great feedback for stepping in to keep the NoSillaCast streak alive so Steve and I can take a vacation. All right, let's get started with this show. In Programming by Stealth, you normally hear structured lessons where Bart Bouchatz is teaching the audience class a new concept with me as the star pupil who sits in the front row asking lots of questions. On occasion, Bart and I come up with ideas for what we affectionately call tidbit episodes. This week, we published Tidbit 8. A month or so ago, Bart finished teaching his mini-series on a language called JQ, which, amongst other tricks, allows you to query JSON files and manipulate the data within them to extract the information you need. When we plugged one of the episodes on Mastodon, we were delighted when Matthias Wadman responded with excitement about our, our show. It turns out he's one of the open-source maintainers of the language JQ that Bart was teaching us. Bart was excited to meet Matthias you know, virtually through Mastodon, and he asked him, would he like to come on the show? Turns out he said yes, and he came on the show to talk about the development of the project, how many people are involved, the genesis of the language, and much more. I wasn't actually there, but then and I got to sit back and enjoy the conversation. You can find this episode of Programming by Stealth in your podcatcher of choice or by going to the post over at pbs.bartificer.net, and that would be slash tidbit eight. Now, we're going to be on a hiatus until after I get back from Africa, so you've got a month or so before there's going to be another episode. Back in 2015, Stephen Getz wrote a review for the show entitled, Have You Considered a Brother Laser Printer? He gave compelling reasons why a laser printer was superior to an inkjet printer, specifically for those who didn't need color. Now, as a home user, I knew I needed color. Steve and I were firmly entrenched in the HP color inkjet world. I had an elaborate inventory scheme to ensure I always had at least one black and one color ink cartridge in stock for both of our printers. Since we each had our own printer, that meant four cartridges in stock at all times. At around $65 for the black ink, and $85 for the color, both in the XL size, that meant I was keeping over $300 worth of ink in stock at any given moment. Then, one day a few years ago, Pat Dengler asked me if I wanted a black and white Brother laser printer for free. It seemed obvious to say yes to this generous offer. We could decommission one color printer, replace it with the Brother laser printer, and still have a color printer for when we needed it. Now, Pat explained that the cartridge in the printer was already saying it was almost out of ink. People always say that the cartridges cost a grip for laser printers, but that they lasted forever, so I was prepared for sticker shock. However, when I went to buy a spare cartridge, I found a set of two Brother-compatible black cartridges were only $27 for the pair. I immediately immediately bought that two-pack. I didn't put one of them in place right away because I wanted to see how long that one would last that was complaining it was almost out. Would you believe it was a full year before I had to replace that cartridge? Anyway, Steve and I both fell in love with that lovely Brother laser printer. We realized that more than 90% of the time, we really only needed black and white. Even most color things for us, they're fine if you just print them in grayscale. The laser printer was wicked fast. It had such clear, crisp text. It was actually a joy to print. And this comes from the woman who penned the article, The Printer is a Lie, and the sequel, Printers are Jerks. I'm not joking about enjoying printing now. I still find it easier to check my taxes by printing out every form and cross-checking against the previous year and the records I've submitted to my accountant. When it came time to print, 
I didn't stress at all because I knew it would actually print. I've never felt that fearless with an inkjet. I also didn't feel bad about wasting ink because I knew it was super inexpensive. With the inkjet, I checked the balance on, in our bank account before printing that many pages. Now, on a few rare occasions, over the past year or so, I've wanted to print something in color. I remember I wanted to print a one-off photo to stick into a thank you note. So I sent the photo to the color inkjet that we keep in Steve's den. I know you'll be shocked to hear this, but it didn't work. Nothing at all came out. I messed around with it a bit, but after three tries, you know what? I just sent the photo file to my local drugstore, hopped in the car and drove over to pick it up. I had no regrets. In fact, I was rather proud of how calm and stressless this pass was versus fighting with the printer. Fast forward to about a month ago when Steve needed to print something in color. The inkjet failed for him too. He kept working on it and he finally did some searching online to try to figure out why the printer simply did nothing at all when he sent the print jobs to it. He discovered that our color inkjet printer from HP wasn't supported under Sonoma. Now, that's not such earth-shattering news, but I found it really interesting that we did not notice for seven months. This was literally only the second time in seven months that we had needed to print color. Now, as seldom as this requirement was, we still did need slash want to print in color from time to time. We'd been compromising and printing in grayscale where color would have been preferable. And so we decided to look at color laser printers. Now, our current free brother laser printer was the HL L2360D, and it was pretty tiny as printers go. It was 14 by 14 inches square and only seven inches tall. It didn't do any scanning or copying, which contributed to its diminutive, diminutive size. I don't know why I use that word because I can't pronounce it. Anyway, it printed at 24 pages per minute. My goal was to get a color laser printer that printed at least this fast and wasn't a giant monstrosity. I decided to stick with Brother, not just because Steve had Stephen had recommended it, but because everyone I know who has a laser printer recommends Brother. Wirecutter recommends Brother. I mean, it's basically the fan favorite. Now, as Steve and I started researching available options, we created a spreadsheet, <laughs> of course we did, where we started recording models, numbers, and specs. We started with dimensions and pages per minute, but quickly expanded our criteria. One thing we didn't want to do was buy a printer model that had been introduced a long time ago, which would make it more likely to be abandoned sooner. It looked like there was a big model push in August of last year because we found a handful of good candidates all introduced in August of 2023. Before I start talking about models and the criteria we looked at, I want to explain some nomenclature from Brother. All of the models we considered have CDW at the end of the model number. That stands for Color Printing Duplex Wireless. Now, I'm not going to keep repeating CDW as I talk about the different printers because that would get really repetitive. Now, Brother Laser models either start with HL or MFC. MFC means multifunction center. That means they're a fax, printer, scanner, copier, all in one. HL doesn't appear to be an acronym that I can find, but it means a regular printer that doesn't fax, scan, or copy. I didn't catch this distinction right away, so I was leaning heavily towards the HL models because they were wee tiny like our beloved HL L2360D that Pat gave us. They were small because they didn't have all of the functionality we really needed. If we were going to replace our HP inkjet printer, that had a copier and scanner in it, and we really did still need that functionality. Now, a few of the models I briefly considered, like the HL L3220 and the HL3300, both only had monochrome LCDs of only one or two lines. Now, they were on the less expensive side at $250 and $370, respectively. I know that sounds like a lot of money compared to an inkjet printer, but remember having to keep spares at $150 for a pair of color and black cartridges? All right. Now, there was another printer-only option that I favored, the L3280. It has a 2.7-inch color touchscreen, and it prints at 27 pages per minute, which is a smidge faster than the 24 pages per minute that our black and white laser could do. It was $300 and had both gigabit Ethernet and Wi-Fi. It was also just a bit bigger square than our black and white at 15.7 inches on a side, but it was even shorter at 10.8 inches high. I pushed on Steve hard to go for this one, but he was all reasonable and logical and stuff and pointed out that we do need to copy from time to time and having a flatbed scanner does come in handy too. I do a lot of scanning with my iPhone directly to our Synology of receipts and such, and Steve has a swanky Epson photo scanner, 
but there are those times that you need a flatbed. That left, left us with just two options, and they were higher priced and huge. The L3720 at $400 and the L3780 at $500. Now, the $400 L3720 was slightly smaller than the L3780, but it only printed at 19 pages per minute, where our existing laser printer, remember, printed at 24 pages per minute. It was also Wi-Fi only, which isn't terrible, but it was going to be sitting right next to a gigabit switch into the router, so it seemed a shame to make that compromise. In the end, the $500 L3780 won our hearts. At 31 pages per minute, it's crazy fast. It's got gigabit Ethernet and Wi-Fi and a three and a half inch color touchscreen. It's a beast though. It's 17 and a half inches by 16.1 inches square and it's almost 16 inches tall. We have it sitting on a credenza that has a 27 inch Apple Cinema display, which is still kicking. And I gotta tell you, this printer is almost as tall as that display. At first I thought it looked atrocious, but you know what? I've gotten used to the size. One of the reasons I was able to swallow the $500 price tag is that the MFC L3780 came with a full set of toner cartridges. I don't mean like those quarter full fake ones. They included the DR229CL cartridges that are listed to print up to 20,000 pages and it only cost $163 to replace those. That's a lot of taxes we could print. You know what? We didn't even bother to buy spares because I'm not sure we're going to live long enough to print that many pages. Now, toner cartridges like this uh, for these kind of printers come in four separate units. You get a black, cyan, magenta, and yellow. I was intimidated at first when I opened the top of the printer. Each cartridge had a very obvious cap on each end, warning me to remove each cartridge, take the caps off, and put them back in. It took less than five minutes and only that long because I was being super cautious because I didn't want to wreck anything. Don't worry, I didn't bother to read the instructions or anything, but I did take my time. After plugging it into Ethernet, running a firmware update, changing the default admin password, adding paper, and then reloading the paper because we'd actually done it wrong, we were ready to print. Holy cannoli are the prints gorgeous from this printer. I mean positively stunning. We thought our previous brother Laser had crisp text. It's nothing like this. We are astonished at the quality. Now, for grins and giggles, I tried putting a piece of glossy paper in it to print a photo, and that was a huge mistake. The toner just sort of, sort of smeared off the paper. Luckily, I didn't do any long-term damage to the printer, and at least it settled my curiosity. I'll still be going to the local drugstore every eight months when I need to print a photo. Now, we love how fast it is after a warm-up time that's list listed as 12 and a half seconds. It copies quickly, scans quickly, prints double-sided on command. You know what else it does? It prints every single time I ask it to. No belly aching, no jam paper, no realignment of cartridge problems. It just works. It even works from our phones and our iPads too. Now, you know I like to do a deep dive on how things work, so I downloaded the PDF manual and it's 680 pages long. Now, I'm not even talking about it being eight languages. That's 680 pages in English. And that doesn't count the seven page table of contents. Now, technically it does talk about Windows, so I guess that's a little bit of a different language. Now, in scanning through the manual and connecting to the web interface to manage the printer, it's pretty obvious that they've, we've put a small business printer in our home. For example, there's an NFC card scanner on the front, so if you want to restrict access to only worthy employees, you can. Maybe I should make Steve use an NFC card to be allowed just to use my new Precious. If the 680-page PDF is overwhelming for you, there's an online user guide at support.brother.com. This makes it a lot less overwhelming. The design of the interface is eh, circa 1982, including a link to the PDF that says you need Adobe Acrobat Reader. It's required to view this. It's functional as this interface is, but my daddy would have called it ugly as sin. The only thing not to like about the Brother line of laser printers is their hard sell for their toner subscription. Lindsay the daughter has an ink subscription for her inkjet printer, but it's literally a dollar a month for 10 pages. So it's a terrific deal. She can add a dollar to it if she runs out too. But for a colored laser printer, the cheapest plan I can get through Brother is $10 a month for 75 pages. I didn't mind them offering that deal to me, but it kept asking me when I opened the app on my phone, so it's a little bit much. Now, the bottom line is that we did spend a large sum on a new color laser printer, 
but to replace our current color inkjet to get a model that worked with Sonoma would have been $150 or so, and I would have had to have keep, kept $150 in spare cartridges around, so I'm really not that much farther behind. Now, our housekeeper's husband is a geek and he loves it when we give him tech, so imagine his delight when he got not only a perfectly functional color inkjet with $150 worth of spare cartridges, and we gave him our black and white brother laser printer with a whole spare toner cartridge. He was just like a kid in a candy shop. I was glad to give it to him, but I was also fascinated that none of my friends or family wanted the monochrome laser printer. They either already had one, or they didn't want monochrome because they were convinced they needed color. And one more thing, in the 680-page user manual of doom, as Donald Burr would call it, it says that the MFC L3780 CDW can print photos on glossy paper. So I guess the printer is still a lie. Well, I've asked Jill from the Northwoods to join us here to talk about her video setup because she's done some really interesting things in uh, improving and setting up herself for success in making YouTube videos. Welcome to the show, Jill from the Northwoods yet again. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. So Jill was going to do a review of these things, and I said, no, I want to do it in an interview because I'm going to have lots of questions. So rather than writing her 28 emails after a recording and going, well, what about this? How did that work? I didn't get this part. I'm going to interrupt her constantly. So that'll be fun for me, at least. <laughs> It'll be fun for me, too. Oh, good. <laughs> She's got a really funny look <laughs> on her face. I wish we were recording video now, but we're not. All right. So what was the problem to be solved here, Jill? So the problem to be solved was I wanted to get into having a YouTube channel. And primarily the reason is you kept reminding me, podcasting is a whole different beast. YouTube and video, that's a whole other thing. You know, they're two separate things. I told and you to run away. Don't ever do it, I think. Run away. Don't okay. ever do it. But Good. one of the things <laughs> that YouTube can do for you compared to a podcast is that you watch one video and it says, well, if you like this video, you might like Jill too. So it's a way of getting discovered. Okay. And my I'm YouTube channel is actually, it, but <laughs> yeah, but my YouTube channel, I mean, it's not doing great, but it's doing, considering I just started it, doing okay. And the idea is that it's going to drive more traffic, I think, back to the podcast. It's free advertising. And I was hoping to also do like nature videos to show people how to observe nature eventually. So this is part so, of, uh, let's let's make sure we have the setup. Jill has a full podcasting empire now with what she's referring to there as the Buzz Blossom and Squeak podcast, which is just a pure delight. As I told Jill yesterday, it's the best combination of science-y kind of stuff mixed with childlike wonder at the world. And those two things combined together, are just it, it, the show is a delight. I love every minute of it. Oh, um, you. But you've also got the Start with Small Steps podcast, Small Steps with God, and what's the name of the Bible podcast again? Um, the Bible and Small Steps. The Bible and Small Steps. And I, aren't there five? I feel like I'm missing one. No, there are five episodes a week, but there are three or uh, four podcasts. Four podcasts. It's okay. Five. So yeah. just, you know, a slacker, not doing that much. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what's the name of your YouTube channel? So the YouTube channel is Start With Small Steps right now. I'm going to unwrangle this so that Buzz Blossom and Squeak has its own channel. <laughs> but okay. right now, everything is just shoving into... I'm, I've kind of split my empire into two worlds. Everything, Buzz Blossom and Squeak and Start With Small Steps is going into Start With Small Steps. And then Small Steps with God and the Bible and Small Steps is all going over there. Oh, At okay. some point, okay. I need to... Yeah, figure out a strategy, which I haven't done yet. But the idea is to get, yeah, how can I make this easy to get a YouTube channel up and running with the least amount of hassle? I don't want to spend hours doing this. Okay. Okay. So that was yeah. the goal. So you needed to acquire, I mean, this wasn't just an excuse to buy a bunch of gear. I'm just checking. Mm. It, it, <laughs> it's hard to tell the difference between that byproduct. and a real goal. <laughs> All right, so the components of what you needed to get, uh, which one do you want to start with? Let's start with the camera, because that's where I started in the whole purchasing of this. I had a Logitech camera that I bought during the pandemic for my endless Zoom meetings that I was going to have. Mm -hmm. And it was fine. It was nice. It was 1080p. But it, I started doing test videos with it. Can I make YouTube videos with this camera? The quality just wasn't really there. My room here is dark by choice. I don't like a lot of light. Um, although I do have hue lights in here. It can be very bright if I want it to, but I tend not to do that. So I just didn't think it was great. So I went on a search to, can I find a better camera? 
and one that's going to be easy. Because one thing that people will do is they'll take their big uh, DSLR or um, mirrorless camera and they'll hook it up and they'll use that as their camera for YouTube. And they that's look what fantastic. A lot of people do. And they look fantastic. But I take my camera with me. I go places with And I just had this image of me constantly wrangling and unwrangling. And then how do you get the video off of it? And I thought, ugh, I just don't want to do that. I want this simple. Right. How can I make this more simple? So I started looking at other cameras and looking at YouTube videos of people using other cameras. And really, Elgato looked fantastic. Now, wait, you they first considered your, uh, your bird has a camera, right? Or is that, your, oh, when you said your big birding camera, you meant like a DSLR. Yeah. Or, oh, okay. That's what you meant. Yeah, my, okay. m- yeah, that's right. I was picturing so the my, camera you have watching your bird. Oh. And I thought, well, that's an interesting choice. I could do a ring camera, but, you know, uh, <laughs> that would be weird. So, yeah. I, and I know that some people do MacBook, you know, camera and say it's good enough. You know, Yeah, it's they're fine. wrong. No, it isn't. It looks horrible. <laughs> Right. I'm sorry, and, Mike. So like I said, I, yeah, I started looking at videos of what pe- people doing this, what their setup is, how do they do it. And two cameras came up to me. And because I love Elgato stuff, I I have a t- the Stream Decks. I've loved everything that I ever bought from them. They have two cameras. And one of them, I'll, I'll start with the cheaper one first, is the MK.2. I think that's two. Mark II, probably. Mark II, yeah, probably. Yeah. And it's called the face cam and it's fine. It goes up to 1080p. If you use uh, USB-C, it's uncompressed. It looks good. You know, or 3.0. I think it's USB-3. It's uncompressed, Yeah, USB-3. Yeah. Yeah, It's uncompressed. And it's good. It has a relatively good low light meter and it's fine and it does really good but part of me got a little disappointed that i went and bought this logitech camera and then i was suddenly buying another camera and i thought i just want to be done buying cameras so you You buying another 1080p camera wasn't solving right the the right problem the right problem right so i thought okay let's take a look at the step up which is the face cam elgato pro that goes up to 4k and in my mind That's future proof because if YouTube videos all go to 4K, it'll be fine and it'll last forever. Within a given definition of future, (laughs) red camera, 8K. (laughs) Right, right. But I thought this is going to last me for a while. It did. It looked beautiful when I saw people who were using it. It has some really nice uh, pan, tilt, crop, zoom, which the other camera had too. But when you're having a higher resolution, you can do more with it. You know, you have more bandwidth to, I think, to do things with it. So, and I wasn't sure, am I going to sit at my desk? Am I going to sit on a couch? How am I going to do this? So, you know, what am I going to do? But this gave me a lot of flexibility. And uh, it has a really nice autofocus on it. So if I were doing some sort of product review and I held up, you know, the mouse, it would zoom in on the mouse. And it was very nice. That is interesting. So uh, to the audience, I'm looking at Jill while she's talking. And um, I saw once... I think it was when you got up to go mess with something, I saw the the focus shift all of a sudden and it was a little mm-hmm. disconcerting. But on the Logitech, at least on the C920s, turning on the autofocus change was basically like showing you were a noob because it would always do that. Like it would go, I'm focused on your nose, now your ears, now the back of your head. It would go yeah. back in and out all the time. It would kind of pulsate and you always had to turn it off. But I have not seen that. I, you are in sh- sharp, crisp focus. You and your background's fairly close right behind you and everything looks nice and crisp. And I'm not seeing that bouncing, but she just held up a mouse and it immediately focused on it. It was very, very quick. Right. So in my mind, it is more expensive. The Mark II the cheaper one comes in at about $150. This one comes in at about $300. Oof, so it is okay. twice the price. It is beefy. But like I said, I'm just getting sick of these piles of technology I have where I say, oh, I have this Logitech camera or I have this or I have that. And it's in a big pile waiting to go to some recycling center. I wanted to just be done with this. Be done. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the then this was around the Black Friday Christmas sales. And I know that Elgato always has some really good sales. So I waited out. Okay. So you got a little better deal. Yeah. All right. So, so I'm, I'm sold on your camera, but uh, the possibly more important thing than a good camera is good lighting. Right. And so this room, like I said, is dark, even though I do have hue bulbs. And if you use hue bulbs, I learned from other YouTube channels, and you shine it on top of you, you get weird shadows. 
where it can right. kind of make your eyes look sunk in because, you know, it can. It, it might okay. not. And I thought, okay, I don't really have any good lighting in here. But here, again, because it was around the sale time, I ended up getting a little tiny portable Elgato Key Light Mini. I think it was actually on your channel. Someone announced it was on sale and I picked it up because okay. my dream is that I'm going to go out into nature and eventually film video. But it's little. <laughs> <laughs> so when I turned it on, it really didn't light up anything much. It's, just a, it's a good accent light. Yeah. So in your show notes, you've got, it's like six by four by three quarters of an inch thick. So it's a little bitty thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A portable LED panel. Now, was this RGB color or different shades of white? It will go all the way from a very warm yellow to a very bright white. Okay. So it has all the ranges, all the all the lights from Elgato will do that. But it's only 800 lumens, okay. which, like I said, it, it's far enough away that it didn't really do much. Didn't do the job. <laughs> so, you know, one thing yeah. people use lights like that for, in fact, I've got a, a small RGB light that's that's similar to this, not quite as fancy, uh, but it is RGB. But um, is you put it behind you or to like light up the back of your head or the side of your head so you get a little bit more glow on your on your hair or whatever it can it can help with that. Yeah. And I think that out of all of this, I wish I would have researched the lights more because first I bought a very small light. I'm not unhappy with it. Like I said, I think it'll be great for different use cases. Uh -huh. But um, I went next and bought the Elgato ring light because it has threads for the camera right in the center of the ring. So oh, you, it, I thought, okay. oh, this is perfect. It has its own stand. I'll put the camera in it. But I suddenly realized now, all the gorgeous YouTubers out there love having that little ring right inside their eye. I hate that. It, and I wear me, glasses. It takes me out yeah. of the element immediately. When I see that ring, all I'm thinking about is what the light looks like. Yeah. And so I couldn't use it as it was intended because I hated the ring and it was just showing on my glasses and it looked strange. But I spent... Like I said, it, it was a good amount of money. It was on sale. It, I like the light itself because it is, first of all, very bright. It's 2,500 lumens. Wow. So it's plenty of light. This is what I'm using right now. It is huge. It also doesn't flicker. And most of these lights adjust their color, sometimes even with just a physical filter over top of it. Huh. Like you're putting a beige color slide okay. over the top of it. This is actually built into the light. It is actually displaying the warmer and the cooler lights. Okay. Through whatever and technology. And I'm not seeing the is. ring except, except except while she's talking to me, she's looking up at the light and then I see the ring on her glasses. Yeah. Okay. You can see it. Yeah. So what I learned on YouTube too is that if you put it way up there and then you look this direction, you, people won't see your ring okay. on your glasses. Now I do have a question. Why are you mm -hmm. why am I not seeing the reflection of your computer display? Because you're looking at me. My glasses are filled with little white windows floating on a black background because that's what my display looks like. Are you in dark mode by any chance? I'm not really because I have um, my document right here all in white. Really? So if I look down, do I look down? Nope. Do you see? Yeah, no, I'm never seeing it. And my glasses are oh. perfectly reflecting every single window. That's, you barely see my eyes. So it's not a ring, but you still see that. Well, oh. that's my problem, though. Yeah, I did get re anti-reflective glasses when I bought yeah, them last I do. time, so maybe that's maybe why. Maybe I should turn I on my uh, my Elgato Key Light Air that I have up above me. Now, did you consider that one? That's a, like a 7x7 seven seven inch flat panel? Well, like I said, I think in the end, I wish I would have done more research. That ring was a cult, uh, was a impulse buy because I thought, oh, it's great. It has a stand. It has a thing. I didn't research any lights. I should have. I didn't. Um, but. I, well, I should I, have considered more lights. I don't like my key light air because no, I just okay. opened up HomeKit to turn it on and it says, yeah, I'm on. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. You're off. Mm. It's very recalcitrant. It does not obey the rules. All right. Right, right. Yeah, so the reason I went for that was it was a more of a flat panel, but it's not super bright. So I think people tend to buy two of them, and now you've got mm -hmm. more garbage on your desk. So you're, yeah. I think your ring light is doing a really good job. I, I would not be disappointed in that. Yeah, oh, it's I'm technically 17 okay with inches it. in diameter? Holy yeah, it's cow. Huge. It is huge. People stick their head through it. Yeah, it is huge. I like it, though, technically, because I'm really sensitive to bright lights. And I turn this to a certain color of beige and a certain level of brightness. It doesn't bother you? It doesn't bother me. And I think that it ends up looking good. 
yeah, the, the yeah, amount yeah. of light I have. So you don't look like end, you live in the Midwest. You look like you have skin color tone and everything. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> hey, we have skin color in the Midwest. All right, so the sun once in a while, <laughs> exactly. It is summer. No, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Yeah. All right. All right so so the, in the end, I'm happy enough with it. Yeah. No, I think, I think your lighting is really good. And one of the things I, I, I know I've repeated this on the show before was I worked with a guy who did a video for the company, and he explained to me. He sent me a video explaining to me why lighting was so important. And he basically just said, you know, if you take a photo in low light, what happens? The person blurs as they move. Well, the same thing right. happens in low light in video. And so he, he had he made a video where he had no lights on and he waved his hand in front of the screen and it was just this smear across the screen. And then he flicked on a light and he did the same thing and it was a perfectly smooth, beautiful video. And I, I've right. never forgotten that because it was just such a vivid explanation of why lighting is so important to video. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I saw that with other people's YouTube channel. Like, I watched a lot of how to set up your own YouTube channel kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. as much as I don't like light that much, I thought, yeah, this is important enough. I was a photographer for enough years, as were you, to know that light's important. So Right, right. Yeah. Now, the uh, last piece of equipment that you put in place, um, we discussed this before uh, getting on the air, is uh, a fairly complicated, not complicated, it's a very interesting piece of equipment that I don't have any experience with. And so Jill's going to do a full detailed review of how it works. But tell us about your teleprompter. Right. So I started doing test videos where I was recording all these videos to see how I would do. Uh -huh. And I noticed that, and you gave me some tips about like how you can put it right by the camera. So it looks like you're looking at the camera, but you're really looking at your notes, mm -hmm. you know, try to get it as close as possible. And I started doing some videos. Uh, Dave Ginsberg has a YouTube podcast. And I noticed that I kept looking at my notes instead of the lovely people on this panel. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see their faces. I wanted to see them talking. And I thought, oh, I just look terrible because I'm just sitting here staring at my monitor instead of staring at these lovely people in the camera. And I thought, I need a teleprompter. And there are some iPad teleprompters out there that are actually pretty good, but they have subscriptions, which I historically am very anti-subscription. And it's it's that now your iPad's on a thing and now the simplicity has gone because now I'm uh, now I'm mon mounting my iPad to where the teleprompter is, but it's still not behind my camera. And I'm like, oh, this is complicated. So again, I tried to look to see what other people were doing. And some this is just when Elgato's prompter came out, which is their teleprompter product. And this is really interesting. It's a nine inch screen, but there's a nine inch screen below it. The nine-inch screen that's flat is actually reflecting up into a mirror so that when I look at it, I see the right side up view of you. So I put you into this teleprompter right now because I'm not reading from a script. I see you in it. And now I can look at your face and we can have this conversation. Okay, so... This is where I get stuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I understand that it's got a mirror, so I'm going to describe mm -hmm. it again because I, I need to keep going over this in my head. Is is it, imagine a, uh, what is it, like a six-inch six inch display or so? Six? A uh, nine-inch. I think nine it's nine-inch. Nine-inch display yeah. that's sitting at the top of her display, but it's mm -hmm. horizontal. So it's if, if you stood up and looked down, you would see the display uh, mm -hmm. of whatever she chooses to put into that display. The, and Upside that's connected down. to yeah. your computer through USB-C. And then right. coming diagonally up at 45 degrees is this mirror. And right. it, and so it reflects onto that mirror and then reflects back to her face. And that way she can see me upright. But now putting me in there is actually just, just putting me in there. If that's all you did, this would be silly because you could have just put me on the screen. So how is this solving the I want to look at my notes while I'm talking right. to her problem? It has a hole right behind the hole inside of the box. This is actually a two-way mirror. You know, think about the crime rooms where you can see in and they can't see out kind of thing. Okay. But the camera will fit um, into the back of the screen. So actually right behind the this mirror. monitor of the, the, back mirror, of the mirror, right back okay. of the mirror is the camera itself. So when I look at you in this mirror, I'm actually looking straight at the camera. 
Okay. Okay. So, so for purely looking at me, uh, now you happen to have video of me right now onto the display, but you could mm -hmm. put your notes onto that display. And when you're looking at your notes, you're staring straight into the lens of the camera. Right. So that's the other functionality. Okay. There's two modes it has to it. One of them, it will just act like a nine inch monitor. So 99% of the time when I'm not recording on YouTube or on some video stream, it is acting as a third monitor for me. Okay. So I, and is it above your, do you, yeah. is it above your, your screen? Yeah. So I just put it right above my monitor, my main okay. monitor. Okay. All right. So I have my notes right down below it. And then I have you looking at, you know, looking at you. So you and I can have a conversation. And you could switch the, the video of me uh, and yeah. with, with the notes if you're, well, when you're doing the YouTube uh, uh, channel and you want to be re referring to your notes as you're doing your extemporaneous video, you would be able to see the notes, but it looks like you're looking right at the, at the audience. Right. And so the second mode is teleprompter mode with text. Okay. So now I can put in my text into this application it has, which is the same app as the camera app, and it will scroll either automatically for you at a certain speed, or I can control the scroll using like a stream deck so okay, that so I can go as fast or as slow as I want. You bought the fancier uh, stream deck that has a dial on it? It has a dial on That's it. That's the new one. Oh, I didn't think of an excuse to need that dial yet. That's yeah. pretty cool. Well, yeah, and I'll talk about why I picked that one in particular. But now I can, I have content, right? I have five podcasts a week. I have a ton of content I'm writing. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, why not use all that great content that I'm creating for my podcast and make short YouTube videos with it? So I have transcripts already made. Oh. And so now I can just flip them into two and have it on my teleprompter and read them in two short bits. Okay. Two short so, oh, video so clips. The and the, the teleprompter. By transcripts, you actually mean summaries of the of the podcast episode? And maybe even just the I have the pure transcripts of my podcast episode. But so you don't I read reading it again the whole no. thing into the no. what are what are your YouTube uh shorts then? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going, I'm not going to reread them as is, but I'm going to use them as an outline for just me talking. Like what? So it'll sort of be a plug for what, yeah. you, what you talk about if yeah. you were to catch this, the whole thing. Yeah. This is BJ Fogg's books on tiny habits. BJ Fogg starts out and I'll summarize what I'm saying in the transcript of my podcast okay. into the video. But I have all this content. I can put yeah. it right there on the teleprompter and use it as a guideline for my video clips. Okay. Okay. That's really cool. Now you said you were going to go get into why you chose the particular stream deck you chose. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm getting ahead. I'm getting ahead. Okay. Uh, you, well, go ahead and do the stream deck and then let's come back to arms because I think arms okay. are interesting too. <laughs> okay. It sounds good. So th that's where the next step came in is I'm really going to do video. Both video and audio are on a timeline, either if you're using Hindenburg for audio or Final Cut Pro for video. It's, it's, a, it's a timeline. And so there's two different aspects I wanted to do with those buttons. Is First of all, I wanted to control this scrolling. So I can sit here very nonchalant and scroll the text of what I put into the teleprompter. Using the scroller on the Elgato Stream Deck the Plus. Stream Deck Plus, right. But then when I'm not using it, I can use it to move along the timeline, either in audio or video, Hindenburg or Final Cut Pro, oh. or Descript. I can use it to adjust volume. I can use it to adjust zoom. Hindenburg, we have a zoom so that we can say, ooh, there's a little place where I hiccuped in there. Can I zoom in and cut out that hiccup? You know, That'll I, zoom in for me. This sounds like a, r a really stupid problem to be solved, but um, I have a lot of trouble zooming in and out on Hindenburg. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the audio recording software that both Jill and I use. And the reason I have trouble with it is I do so much in ScreenFlow and ScreenFlow, the keystroke is slightly different. Like one of them, it's just plus and one of them's command plus. And if I do the wrong thing, it like edits in a different way because the keystroke means something in the other app. And now I'm always paralyzed when I want to do it. So I say, okay, well, I'll just use my fingers to pinch and zoom on the trackpad, but it's super clumsy. Like sometimes I, f I feel like I have to put two fingers on it from two separate hands to pull it apart. Like I can't just pinch and zoom with a finger uh, with two fingers on the same hand. So that actually might help me a lot too. 
it also has a very small touch screen, which is a, just a band mm. in it, which you can use to switch profiles just using your finger. But you can actually use the band as a Stream Deck button. Oh, geez. So uh, you wow. could actually scroll left and right using this. So I've told you that my winter goal is to learn how to use Stream Deck and Kibo Maestro and bring this whole world together so it's perfectly set up. I haven't set it up perfectly, but it does a great job with those dials. I like cool. the dials. Cool. Well, I look forward yeah. to learning that from you because my new plan is I just wait for Jill to learn stuff or I actually give her assignments, go learn this and then tell me how to do it. And she's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So uh, the Stream Deck with its just customizable buttons, which is already part of Stream Deck, the profile, so I can have one for Final Cut Pro, one for Hindenburg, one for Descript, one for when I'm recording videos. I, I, I have everything just in that Stream Deck. And that is my recording Stream Deck. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at my Stream Deck and I realize I use like five buttons and I bought the <laughs> four times eight, 48. Wait, four times eight? Is that 48? Boy, 32, uh, times eight. 32, 32. Uh, button <laughs> stream deck, and I've got four profiles set up and everything, and I only use these four buttons across the top. <laughs> I could have had the stream deck mini for what I use it for. Right. Okay, so well, that just means you got to use it for more. Exactly. So that's the Elgato stream deck plus, and that was another $200. But you had already gotten that before you went down this road, right? No, no, no. That was the final purchase. <laughs> because I said, there's something missing here. Like, I need to have this kind of control when I'm sitting here and recording videos so that I don't have to look at the screen and I can control. Okay. So that was the final purchase. That okay. was the nail in the coffin to my budget. <laughs> yeah, you uh, you did well here. Um, now, let's yeah. talk about arms. So all these things need to be mounted somewhere. What did you get? Right. So Elgato also makes a fantastic series of arms. And one of them, I needed a very tall one for this key light, but it came with that. So it came with this gigantic desk mount, straight up mount. Not, not key so light, it, the ring light, you mean? Oh, I'm sorry, the ring light. Yeah. Okay. The ring light came up with a gigantic pole that okay. now towers above everything. 29 and inches high. Wow. Can okay. go to 29 inches high, which is at its max right now. So you don't see the little rings. Mm -hmm. And then I bought the, let me get to my notes here. So then I got to the Elgato Flex Arm Large. That's the L. And what it is, is just a bunch of elbows that connect to each other. Hmm. So I took the mini light and I just made a bunch of elbows so that it is actually swinged on the other side. It just highlights a little dark. Okay. You know, it's okay. Just so that's light. on the. She turns around to the, do the coordinate for transfer. Yeah. That's on the left side of your face. Right. Okay. Yep. So you are so, still and, using the little one. That's good. I'm still using the little one. And then I got the Elgato Mini Mount, which has a little floor stand or a desk stand, and it just goes straight up. And it has threads on the top. And I put the teleprompter on that, which rests right over the top of my monitor. Okay. Okay. So it's not actually clamped to your monitor or anything like that. Okay. That's right. neat. It, it is probably too heavy to do that. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Good yeah, to know. It's, it's beefy. Okay. I didn't realize that. And then is the uh, camera, the Elgato camera that you bought, is that actually mounted to the teleprompter? Or is it just And so that is, it, it? yeah, it, sits, it, it has a bracket. So the teleprompter comes with a series of brackets, whether you're using your regular DSLR camera or mirrorless camera whether you're using your iPhone or, in this case, I just use the face cam because they made the whole system. And so it just slides right in. You screw the mounts in. And so now this is one piece together. Okay. The two USBs in it. So they clamp. It's together. Okay. Another yeah. reason why it's a little heavy is because it's got all those pieces together. Well, that's right. really cool. Yeah. This, is, this is fantastic. So in the end, um, now, have you created a whole bunch of videos as a result of this, or is that the next step? <laughs> I started uh, creating, um, now I'm on six videos. So I just got put on a medication and I thought, well, let's just talk about my experience on this medication and just put it on my YouTube channel just as a little experiment of me making videos. Let's oh, just neat. get started uh -huh. doing something. Right, right. <laughs> Anything. And You mean you started it, with small steps then? I did start with small steps, <laughs> right? So um, I, I I just made now I'm a, a six or seven videos in, and they're just about fifteen minutes long, just to just get my feet wet in this and 
it's been really good. It's been very fast. It has a little bit to do with the software, which we're not going to talk about in this. But this setup is everything I wanted it to be. Simple, easy to use. Turn it on, record something, turn it off. And has other uses when you're not using it. So you didn't just yep. throw money at it and have it be sitting idle most of the time. Right. This acts as a little tiny monitor for me, the mm -hmm. teleprompter, right. when I'm not recording, which is most of the time. So I just put Telegram up there. Okay. So I can see when someone chats at me while I'm while you're doing whatever away. I'm doing on my computer. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a perfect telegram monitor. <laughs> well, this is fantastic. So the one thing I uh, did ask Jill to do, and I mentioned it earlier, is I want her to do a full review of the teleprompter because she started showing me the software behind this. And it's got some real interesting flexibilities of how to deal with the camera. And the fact that the camera is also Elgato, I think, helps with what she's able to do with it. And uh, there were a lot of buttons and dials, and it looked like a lot of fun. So she's going to do a separate review of that for us. But I really want to thank you for coming on to tell us about this stuff, because this is kind of cool, having this overarching view with some of the detail, and then we'll get more detail later. So if people want to find your work, they would go to? A better life in small steps com. That is all my podcasts, and there's a blog that my friend M writes, and it's just a list of all the different podcasts I have. Great. That's, I'm glad you've got it consolidated now. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> One thing. <laughs> All right, Jill from the Northwoods, thank you so much for coming. This was fantastic. I had a good time. Oh, I had a good time too. It's a good way to throw some money at something, for sure. <laughs> we all love that. You know who's really swell? George from Tulsa. I mentioned earlier that he sent in a two-part recording for one of the folks to play on the show while I'm gone. And he almost always does that whenever I put out the call. He's also someone who's listened to the show for ages and ages. And that means a lot to me too but he also contributes financially. His method of choice is to go to podfee.com slash PayPal and drop in a random dollar amount that seems right for him at the time, and then he usually adds a goofy little comment to make me giggle. If you'd like to be swell like George, please consider going to PayPal and dropping a little money my way to support the podcast. You can put in a comment to make me giggle too if you want. What's well, that time of the week again? It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 798 for August 6, 2024, and I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is again the venerable Adam Angst of Tidbits. Welcome back to the show, Adam. Venerable? Have I gotten that old that quickly? <laughs> I feel like I should have like the Fu Manchu beard. <laughs> I thought about looking it up. The problem with writing and, and talking to Adam is he's so precise that I've got to, I got to really pay attention to my word choices here. Uh, You'd be the real-time thesaurus. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Well, Adam wrote an article recently about his solar inverters that ended up being almost more a story about troubleshooting, and that inspired me last week to tell you my story of troubleshooting the net network, uh, our home network problems. And we kind of thought it'd be fun to go through Adam's story and pick out ideas for troubleshooting and kind of maybe talk about where our own weaknesses are, where our blind spots are. Does that sound like a good way to start? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so talk about the, uh, the basic structure of what happened. Yeah, so so the basic structure is global warming sucks. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, <laughs> that 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 yes, this is real. And so I grew up in this area um, making hay on a farm, so I'm pretty aware of weather. And this and area the weather is... has just gotten insane. I'm sorry, upstate New York. Okay, so we we are in a world, you know, part of the world where. I won't say nothing bad happens, but we don't get tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, forest fires. Like those aren't our problems. Uh, so, so you know, like this has been one of those kind of situations where, in the past five ten years, thunderstorms have become insane. Mm. And so, when you know ten uh, nine years ago we put in solar power, we thought. <clears throat> well, you know, we lose power, but not that often and never for that long. So we're not going to mess around with one of those whole house battery systems. This was also nine years ago when they were more expensive and less used, less common. But we'll pl we'll put in some some power plugs on our on our solar inverters. And maybe we could plug something into them, you know, when when power was out for the grid. And so fast forward to the present and we have lost power um, six times this year, four times in two weeks. Oh, wow. So. I, I feel like I'm in, you know, the third world somewhere where, you know, like, you know, we have to have your 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 garage size generator for for everything because it's just like, oh yes, we're on, you know, brownouts every day. So it was just kind of crazy. But the solar and you think of the solar panels as 
providing power. You don't think of them as having problems related to to uh, to power outages, right? You know, like they make it; they don't need it. But, but, but it turns out the solar panels they, don't just like blow electricity at your house. There's components involved. <laughs> I was shocked at how many components are involved. Oh yeah, they're connected. There's no question. Um, and um, but but there's one part of it that actually is a little bit more subtle than others, which is. We have um, they communicate with a with web portal, and that's how you discover how much power you've made. If there's any problems with them, they report it on the portal. They also send the email, which I every day, which I kind of like getting because I can see, oh, good solar day, oh, good solar day, oh, that was a terrible solar day, you know. <laughs> uh, so, in any event, um, uh, after an earlier power outage this year, um, they didn't the, the the monitoring didn't come back online. So they were producing power. I could go outside and see the little graphs and they were making power, no question. But it wasn't getting to the portal. And because of, I mean, like this is, a, the, the portal is basically a way of keeping score, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is, you you want your points. <laughs> oh, totally. My my friends and I have all put in solar and we're always comparing our graphs and stuff going, ah, well, <laughs> you only got to, you know, so many kilowatts. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So, so in any event, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little put out by this. And I reach out to the company that put them in, a company called Halco. And and they say, oh, you know, well, it's like, oh, we can send someone out. And I'm like, you know, like, I, I could probably, is there something I can just reset? You know, like, I'm, I'm sufficiently technical, I can reset things. And they're like, oh, well, if in that case, we won't bother to, you know, send a tech. If, you know, just do this, you know, flip, flip, flip. There's three inverters, flip those switches, flip three circuit breakers here, wait five minutes, reverse the process. Hang on. Okay. For, no for everyone problem. else, what is an inverter? What does it do? Ah, so the inverter. This is this is where I get a little on the iffy side. Inverter takes DC from the panels and converts it into AC for the house and the grid. Is okay. that correct? Well, You're we more can of an say for sure uh, it's an ADD or D to A converter. Whether we either of us know which yes. A is to D, that's why I always ask Steve because <laughs> it's just I've got a pocket electrical engineer here, so I just ask him. <laughs> yeah, so basically they're the they're the the devices that the panels connect into that then do all the work of something or other and then feeding it into the house. Make it uh, electricity people you did can ask take out of the plug. Expo- Precisely. Okay. <laughs> um, people did ask me to uh to uh to, to uh you know explain what I had at some point more and I'm like you really don't want me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a I have a general view of this, but I'm really a computer guy, not a solar guy. Steve and so, I spent weeks trying to diagram our system so that we could explain it to people. And it and that was with, you know, I'm an engineer, I got a master's degree, but it's a mechanical engineering, so I'm impaired in some way in this uh, category, but it, what we found was the more we worked on the diagram, the more we understood how it worked because we clearly did not understand how it worked. I mean, I knew I didn't understand <laughs> at the beginning. Steve thought he understood. And now I yeah. couldn't explain it to you without that diagram in front of me. <laughs> so so in any event, the, you've got all the all the power stuff, but then you've got these Ethernet cables that come out of the, the inverters and connect one inverter to the next, and then they go into the house and they plug into an Ethernet switch. Wait. Magic after that. Wait, like, Ethernet? What Ethernet, is, because they got to talk. They've got to talk to the portal. They communicate with the portal. Okay, ours has a cellular modem on it. Oh, you're all fancy, like no, we have Ethernet. Yeah, you know, the okay. pink, the kind of the peptobismal pink cables. Okay, okay, um, good. Good to know what color so, the cables are. Um, that, well, they're not blue, which is the other question. With you know your Ethernet cables, are the blue cables, right? <laughs> um, so okay, um, so yeah, so 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 the, so. The, after this previous power outage, I had to reset the system, did did all these little basically flipping of switches, right? You know, it's just a reset. And did that, it came back online, life was good. So it happens again in the first of my four power outages uh, uh, this, this, this past two weeks. Um, and, um, and so I go do the thing. You know, the next morning, I, like, I don't think about it. The next morning I go back, I, realize, I get the email, I realize, oh, it's not working. I go back, I, I flip the switches. But the power goes out again that day. Oh, gee. oh so it so, fixes it again now a second time. But, well, no, no. But it I, don't, goes out I don't know if it fixed it. So oh. I don't know if it fixed it. I, 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 was, I was busy. I was like, I was doing stuff. So I reset it. I assumed it worked. And I figured I'll get the email tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I didn't actually like log in immediately to see if the portal was working. Okay. All right. So, so, it, so it fails. You know, so the power goes out the next day. 
and I get the, you know, the email saying zero kilowatt hours, you know, produced. Okay, fine. It didn't work. So I reset it again. And the same thing happens, right? Like I'm waiting for the email the next day. Um, and it, that was a, like a weekend. I was super busy. And so it took uh, the third power outage where I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, right. I'm still not getting the email from this thing. And the power again, power goes out. So by the time I've, I've reset it, it's gone out again. <laughs> like, yeah, what do I got to do here? Um and so it wasn't until then where I'm like, you know, this is really not working. You know, mm. this is not just like a reset thing. I mean, I've done the reset correctly. I feel I'm like you're sure. a mouse in an experiment. Somebody's just pressing <laughs> the button to see if you'll do it again. <laughs> we gave him cheese the first time. Let's see how many times we can get him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just pushing the button, man, waiting to get my cheese. <laughs> So that was terrible. So so eventually, I reach out to the to the company. It's like like I've reset this. I've I've, I've done my thing. It's not working. Could you send a tech out? Luckily, the tech can come out in a couple of days. He does, and it, this is this is where it starts to get embarrassing. This is likely oh, <laughs> um, and so so he goes out and he looks at it and he 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 bonks on them the way you the way it turns out you get these these inverters to show you trouble to you know, like status information is you bonk on them. Are you serious? You literally knock them. Yes, <laughs> like there's a display that's blank until you until you whack it. it it's not blank, but it, it cycles through different things. <laughs> so. Okay. Did you did People you get this were like, from like really? Bob's you inverters tr- <laughs> and, and hair care no, products? S- SMA, SMA Energy. I think they're German, so you know, very very precise. But uh, but any event, yeah, it's the strangest interface ever. So you know, he shows me that, and I'm like, oh, good to know. And he shows me that you know they have IP numbers and everything. So like from their perspective, they're doing the right thing, and they're not 169s so, or anything. They're a reasonable well, yeah, we didn't look at them closely enough i think that actually i think they were 169s okay. uh, now that I, okay. now that i'm thinking back to it to anybody so who else says, who's okay, listening, well, 169 means <laughs> yeah you don't really have a connection you i'm just going to show you a number assigned. yeah yeah it's a self-assigned ip number and it usually means that there's no connection at all um right. so 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 we go in he says okay well from from the outside perspective it all looks good let's go inside and look at your thing and so we go in and i don't know do you have like the little rat's nest of where stuff all connects up and you know, like it's device and device and all these little cables and power cables and everything? Well, we've got a, a, a box on the outside of our house where the ONT is, our, which is our optical network terminal from our fiber optic mm-hmm. company. And a lot of stuff goes in there, but it's not like where the router is. Where the router is, I've right. got as many cables as yeah. I can possibly cram behind that cabinet. Precisely. That's what I got. So that's where I am. So, okay. you know, so I've got all these, you know, four or five little devices. They're all got Etherneted into various things. It's the Eero base station and a couple of, you know, an Ethernet switch and a couple of little monitoring, um, Internet of Things monitoring tools. Yeah. And so, uh, so we, you know, I say, hey, you know, here's the pink cable. It goes in right here and you can see it's plugged in. And as I'm looking at it, I'm going, and why are there no blinky lights? I mean, everyone knows internet network networking stuff works on blinky blinky lights. lights. Right, right. I wonder if you could yeah. take a light and blink it at it, and it would work. It's that kind of thing, right? So, what <laughs> well, device? You've got optical. You could you. <laughs> <laughs> what device didn't have blinky lights? The Ethernet switch. Oh, and so okay. this was the problem. There were like five devices back there, four mm-hmm. or five devices, and some of them had blinky lights. And so like I just was kind of and this is like this is kind of a dark corner of our laundry room. Like it's sure. not a you know, just it's where the it's where stuff comes in in a certain way or used to come in actually in a certain way. So it's kind of where everything lives. And uh, and so the um what happened was that uh, I had just looked in the dark corner, seen some blinky lights and assumed mm-hmm. all the blinky lights were on. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until this guy is standing next to me and I'm just you know, like here's the cable plugs into why is this not getting any blinky lights? Yeah. And so, and so we, we it, but you know, really others are. And so he's like, he says, oh, well, maybe it got fried. And I'm like, nah, it's plugged the into whole, a UPS. Like the whole here. switch, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, says, he says, oh, that happens. You know, I've seen that happen. And he's like, oh, and I was like, yeah, but it was plugged into a UPS as I point down to the UPS right underneath it, mm-hmm. uh, which is clearly working because it has a light on it. And, you know, the other things are turned on. 
So, um, so then we, you know, we're like, oh, this is this one's working, and there was one other of the little devices up there that wasn't working, and we we start p- moving plugs around, and you know, and at some point, I pull the UPS out of its dark corner, and it has a master enable button on it and a light next to it, okay. uh, which is not the power button, sort of next to the power. It's like button. a reset. Is it it's, yeah, it's like a, just a just a just a just a preset. So master enable, it turns out. Uh, as soon as I see this, I'm like, oh crap! I know what's gone wrong. So this is I've never really paid much attention to this, but all UPSs or most UPSs, consumer level UPSs anyway, have this concept of a master or computer mode where you plug your computer into one outlet, and when that one gets turned off because the computer shuts down, it turns off power to other outlets. So you think of, you've got you've got like, I don't know, an inkjet printer or something attached. You do not ever want to have the inkjet printer powered on unless the computer is powered on. There's no reason for that to ever be true. Um, Same thing with maybe like an external hard drive that has an external power supply, you know, things that like they make no sense to ever receive power unless the computer is running. Okay. So, and so, yeah. Okay. So, so this, I, I've literally oh. never heard of this. And I just did some UPS work yesterday oh. with a new UPS. Did you look? You have a, you have a cyber power UPS, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, if you look at the back of your UPS, does it have, um, does it say something like, you know, computer here or controlled by computer with outlets like have that different, different, I got to go back and look at it them? again. <laughs> and then I can't guarantee that it's universal. This was an APC UPS, but I've seen it on others. Okay. Um, I just I just thought so, that, like you've got the side that's that's surge protection only, and the other side is surge yep, protection yep. plus battery. And so I put stuff like my Eero and my Ring uh, alarm system and my Synology on the battery side. Yep, precisely. And but there's but there's another chunk, another v- variable, which is which ones are controlled by the master outlet, master outlet. or can be. I mean, I again, I guarantee okay. this is all. <laughs> okay. So so the problem as soon as I realized I realized what the problem was, which was when the power goes out, this UPS starts screeching. Right. I mean, oh man, are they freaking annoying? Um, and so like I know the power's out. Shut up. <laughs> And it's in a dark room, a dark corner of a room, which does not have any lights on because there's no power. Mm-hmm. And so I went into the room, uh, presumably in the first power outage, um, and I kind of reached around in there and I pushed a button. And it wasn't apparently the right button. It wasn't the power button that shuts off the power and, and thus the screech. And it was the master enable switch. And I probably figured, and I probably said, oh, that didn't do it and pushed another button, you know, and it turned off. And I didn't even think twice about it. I know I didn't think twice about it. So when the power comes back and I turn everything back on, the Eero, which is the, the router, so it's sort of the main device, and I had that plugged into the, you know, the master outlet, the computer outlet, it doesn't draw enough power to turn on the other ones. What? Oh, yeah. my. but had had it been plugged in this way all along? Yep. Oh, but, but you never been enabled master that master enable mode. Okay, so master Precisely. enable doesn't have to be it, it, it exist. Doesn't have to be on, right? Doesn't oh. have to exist because 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 in just a situation just like this, you don't want it to exist, right? You no. want every outlet to be active because duh, that's the whole point of active outlets. So. By enabling it, I had basically said, you know, look for enough of a draw on this outlet to that these other ones should be turned on. It, you know, the Eero, I forget what it takes, is like, you know, three to five watts, something like that. It's tiddly. We um, and so it, it's not enough to, for the master, en- master enable mode to turn on the other outlets, which these two things happen to be plugged into, even though several others were plugged into other, th- other outlets. And so it was, it was absolutely a case of, is it plugged in? <laughs> you know, but like the answer is, well, yes, but yes, but. <laughs> so somehow there, but there was an original problem. 
I mean, you made it worse <laughs> in, in, in in fixing it until it's broken. I, <laughs> but, but what caused it to I, be I down in the first place? Well, so the the problem was that no, I actually caused I caused the problem by pressing the switch. Um, it was just I thought I was turning off the UPS. Instead, I was enabling master mode. And, you know, it, it was a mistake that took like two seconds, right? And then I like, oh, wrong button and pushed another button. And that turned off the UPS. So that's why I didn't realize. And the reason, and because I did this when the power went out, it was never going to communicate. The communications were never going to recover because <sighs> that Ethernet switch that the inverters plugged into wasn't powered. Okay. Okay. So the, 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 when you press the wrong button was the first time the power went out. Right. Right. Oh, okay. Precisely. Not the fourth. I thought it was this so, fourth time through. Not the, okay. not, the, you know, not the second, third or fourth times, you know, like who knows? I mean, you know, by that time I'd realized where the power button was, right. You know, like I've been turning the damn thing off all week. So, right. Right. Uh, and so, and, and so there were other, there were other hints really, right. If you think about it, this, cause the switch is used, was used for other things. It was used for, um, I, you have these little things called wireless sensor tags, which do temperature monitoring and live in my fridge, freezer, and um, chest garage, uh, chest freezer outside. They weren't reporting, um, but they don't, they only report in error conditions. So who, you know, I wouldn't oh, there's I no, go for I'm a month working. without, there's no, I'm working, right. They only report if the temperature gets too high in these cold, you know, these cold devices. Then there was a, a device um, that connects to our thermostat so that I can, you know, control the thermostat remotely from my iPhone. But, you know, whatever we it's it's on a it's on a schedule. I almost never bother to use that unless we're traveling for some reason. And I and even then I don't really use it because we have geothermal. So it's not you don't you don't adjust your thermostat much. OK. And um, and then the Eero actually connects to another Eero on the other side of the house via Ethernet for backhaul. Right. Um, so it's a mesh network with a net with a wired backhaul. And. Tanya and I had actually had a discussion at some point in the middle of all this going like, boy, you know, connectivity seems a little, a little weak. You know, why is the connectivity a little weak? I, was like, I don't know. I mean, I actually rebooted the, the, the Eero in my office. Didn't seem to make any difference. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, but basically, our com her computer only uses Wi-Fi. Mine can use Ethernet or Wi-Fi. And I just didn't, I didn't notice. Like, it doesn't tell you which network adapter is active. So I hadn't looked to see. And so all of these little things had sort of gone wrong, but none of them were the kind of thing you'd notice. All well, I noticed was the inverters. Okay. Okay. So if, you're, if your Eero wasn't drawing enough power to keep the other outlets on, it was still drawing power? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the Eero the, was powered the from the UPS. Oh, yeah. The ear, the, that 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 master computer outlet okay. gets power regardless. It just shuts off the other ones. So when did, it doesn't have enough. Okay, so you uh, you've got two Ethernet cables on that one coming uh, from your ISP, and the other one is from the switch. Or do you have do you have it connected yes. to the switch? Okay. So yep, precisely. The Eero the Eero gets connected to the cable modem. And the other, the other one goes to the switch, and then the and that switch one going to goes... the switch wasn't working either. Okay, so the, oh, to... so the other, the other Eros were were only using Wi-Fi backhaul. They didn't have wired Ethernet anymore. Precisely. Okay. Precisely. But that's just sort of that one's uh, so subjective, right? Seems cruddy, right? It's kind right. of dodgy. You Precisely. run a speed like, test, yeah, huh? you know. Yeah, you know, and like it's, it worked fine for internet most of the time, but you know, like you just you never quite know. Um, yeah. you know, the network's being a little flaky and, you know, and cable modems, uh, my experience with cable modem is, is the, the speeds vary widely. Right. Right. Um, right. You know, Bob down the street, your neighborhood is streaming, uh, Roblox right now, you know? <laughs> yeah, precisely. So, so, so it was, it was, a, it was, it was, it was, you know, one of those situations where I was like, I cannot believe that I completely missed, is it plugged in? Because I should have seen that it didn't have blinky lights to begin with it was more that i wasn't looking closely enough to see the right devices had the blinky lights well i don't know about your switch but uh, i eventually looked at my switch because i was you know by this time i was checking to see if you know flushing the <laughs> toilet was affecting the network uh but i looked at the switch and i went oh my gosh there's no blinky lights and i went oh wait the blinky lights are on the back so my blinky lights are not on the front because all the wires go out the back to be in that giant mess in the back. So I have to like put my hand back there to see if any light is reflecting off of it in order to tell us something happening back there. Um, and, and likewise, in my, it, 
That means the switch is being on the back of the UPS. Why wouldn't the power switch be on the front of the UPS? Uh, the, 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 the switch that I touched was on the front of the UPS. So, um, but it was a dark room. So, oh, okay. And this know, is this master thing. This, what do you call this it? This master thing, right? Master power the enable. Master thing. enable. That yeah. is on the front. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so, like, again, I don't know why they bother to put it on the front. It's not something you're going to press regularly, right? You know, like, you know, put it, put it on the back where it doesn't get accidentally touched. But uh, my Ethernet, my, my Ethernet switch like yours does most of the lights on the I think it has a I think it has one light on the front, but it yeah. has most of its light on the back for each for each pour. But um, because I don't actually mine's mine sitting on a shelf and you're I'm, I want the cables coming into it where I can see them. It's actually okay. fa- its back is facing out. OK, well, so I should get all of the, all the blinky lights there. Yeah, and anyway, that, was the, that was the mistake. No. <laughs> <laughs> I well, if, if, if there had been no lights back there i would have figured it out right away yeah but the fact that several of the devices the ones that weren't plugged into these two controlled outlets um did have lights you know i just sort of oh, like clearly there's power oh, I'm, I'm missing there. a subtlety so you're saying on the switch had power no some oh. of the other devices oh, some of the other devices sitting there plugged yeah. into the ups yeah had power so it was like two out of five were were dark okay okay and so the others being light you know again i was like just didn't i just assumed it, it turns out that a lot of troubleshooting mistakes come when you you just assume something is true without actually verifying it and yeah. as soon as i verified you know with this guy standing there standing there next to me that oh wow there's no blinky lights on my switch and this other device oh uh, they're not getting power. So I wouldn't have even known that that master power thing existed. Like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm going to look. What <laughs> but we're now done. you do. Well, I'm going to look and see if I have one. But I mean, I looked at all the buttons yesterday and I don't remember seeing anything called that. So I'm, I'm going to have to go take a look. So other com- other UPSs I've seen, um, I don't know if they have a button exactly. I, I, this is the only time I've ever seen it have a button. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't know how it is nor if it's normally more of a, a built in feature or if there's some other way of enabling it, um, that they, that they provide. So yeah. I have not done a, a, a comprehensive survey of UPSs to, uh, to, to, to see how, how it varies from UPS to UPS. And we have another thing that we've been assuming that we are starting to think maybe we need to maybe do a little bit more verification on, but our, um, uh, one of the questions we have is why did the power go out on the UPS when it, when it lost power? Because we have a whole home battery that should right. never have lost. You power. shouldn't, you shouldn't have, right. There's no losing power there. <laughs> so what we don't know is, is it because the, um, UPS was failing or, and it somehow caused some weird side effect that it shut itself down as a result, or is that outlet maybe not actually on the on the battery? Because we weren't able to put all of our circuits onto the battery. We believe that it is, oh, but what if we're yeah. wrong? So that UPS becomes yeah. a lot more important. It, it is true. I have um, my my uh, my circuit breaker box is absolutely jammed full. I mean, to the point where I forget what we had to have an electrician put in, you know, more circuit breakers for something. He had to actually remove several and replace them with half size ones. Yeah. So that, which they have now. And, um, and then we also have this device uh, called an e-gauge, which it, it, it sits and looks, it, it ties into each one, well, in theory, each one of the circuits in the box and tells us what power, how much power that circuit is using. Oh, that's cool. Uh, it's really cool. Um, and so, uh, um, so they like, again, the inside of our box is truly <laughs> scary looking, <laughs> you know, I mean, the gray outside is fine. You open the door, it's not terrible, but you take the front off. You're like, well, nah. <laughs> do not, that, that do not touch. No, I highly recommend uh, doing your circuit upgrades with uh, solar in this particular order. First, pay a crap ton of money to have a whole new uh, larger box put in so that you can accommodate the solar panels. Then six months later, change your mind and decide to add whole home batteries where they have to take everything out of that, uh, that giant box and put most of it into another box. So now we have this huge 
I, Steve would say words with volts and switches and numbers and stuff on it, this giant box. And now there's hardly anything in it. There's like four switches in there and everything's in another <laughs> box. So we tried to pay for everything. Oh, and we had, we have this thing called a dog house on the side of our house. And that's where the, the, it sticks out. It's a box with a door on it. And that's where all the circuitry is. And we actually had to pay to have a new door put on it because they had to expand it because you couldn't get in and out of that giant box. Well, now you don't need to get in and out of that giant box because all the stuff's on the other side of the wall anyway. Well, it's actually good to know that there's this doghouse concept because I said, I don't know if they'll be able to ever do anything else with our, with our electricity. Again, I just can't imagine there's room. Yeah. And um, we have uh, we have a Nissan Leaf. One of our cars is electric, uh-huh. um, but we've only we only have it just plugs into one ten. We don't have a charger, uh, you know, a, a level two charger for it. And so, what all this has gotten me thinking about is, well, you know, sure, those whole house batteries are kind of cool, but wouldn't it be even cooler if you had the whole house battery with wheels where you could go and recharge it somewhere else? Yeah. And so, the vehicle to gr- vehicle to grid stuff, and so. It's not quite there yet, but once you've got a bi-directional charger, you should be able to, you know, just be charging your car. And then when the power goes out, it just reverses and starts feeding the house from your 70 kilowatt hour battery in the car. Right. That's that's what's really ironic to us is we paid uh, ten thousand dollars a piece for I think they're twelve and a half or thirteen kilowatt hour yep. batteries when we have two seventy five thousand or 75 kilowatt hour battery sitting in the garage, you know, and yeah. uh, one of the interesting surprises to us, and this was part of us drawing the diagram that we figured out was um, when we, when we figured out the circuitry of what goes on the whole home battery, we had to eliminate certain things and basically things that have high power draw, like, like the oven is really bad and, and charging the cars. So we wouldn't be able to charge the cars from these little wimpy batteries. And, uh, and that was fine. We understood, okay, we won't use the oven. We, don't bake or cook anything in it anyway. I think we heat plates with it. And and obviously the cars, that's fine. Uh, we got a, a heat pump system that's a variable speed, so it doesn't have this high kick of whatever those are, volts or watts or whatever. So current, maybe current. Uh, amps, that's probably it. Um, Steve's going to kill me when he hears this. But uh, it, it doesn't have this high draw up front. It, it comes up slowly, so we could actually have our air conditioning on the battery, which is cool if necessary. What we didn't realize was that if the grid is up and we're generating solar energy from the panels and we're putting it into the grid, the battery, into the battery, I should say, the battery can power those things. It's only when the, when the grid is down that the battery can't supply power to the oven and to the cars. So we can charge our cars from the sun without sending right. it out to the grid and taking it back. It can go into the batteries and it can co- come straight from the solar. We can actually uh, uh, do it because it can draw enough. I guess the current level thing works fine as long as there is a grid to fall back on. Yeah, it's pretty clear this is this is an extremely complicated thing. And, and I suspect, you know, that basically when we want to go to a level two charger, um, for uh, uh, some sort of new electric car to replace the Leaf, which is a 2015 model, same as our solar panels. Um, the we will, my guess is they're going to say, "Oh, you don't have enough power." Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. that's just it's it's almost cer- it's almost certain there's there's going to be something which is not not going to work in a big way. Hundred percent. I'm just I'm just I'm, just, I'm setting the expectations there for myself. Yeah. Um, so you know, so it's not going to be the like the three hundred dollar electrician visit. It's going to be the five thousand dollar electrician visit. So yeah, it, you know, it, I got to get a little myself. trickier. <laughs> the uh, the funny thing about uh, the whole home batteries <clears throat> is they don't actually. They don't actually save you money, at least where I live, the way our power works. We get paid for every or every kilowatt we put into the system. Kilowatt, kilowatt hour? I don't know. Every unit of electricity we shove into the grid and we bring back, it's 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 kilowatt to, to kilowatt. I mean, it, it's it's the same right. unit. So if we if we generate one unit during the day and we take that same unit back at night, it's it's zero sum game. If we generate too much electricity, then we only get paid pennies on the dollar for it. But for the rest of the time, it isn't. So yeah. the battery doesn't actually save us any money the way the, the solar panels do. So there is no ROI. But if you live somewhere where the power actually goes out a lot, then there's ROI from a personal level, right? Right, right, precisely. Yeah, I mean, there, there, I mean, some people can do, you know, sort of uh, 
um, time time arbitration. You know, where mm. if you can charge your batteries when, on cheap power and then use them on long, on on expensive power and things like that. But like, when you're yeah. when you're mo- making most of your power via solar, that doesn't usually help in a big way. Yeah, we actually it's uh, the cost is double. We have a special plan for people who have solar panels, and the cost is double during from four to nine for what it is the rest of the day. Right. So we go off battery between four and nine and we just, you know, don't run the dishwasher, don't charge the cars, that's it. And so that does save money. We are also part of a, a, a system in California and I know other places are doing it too, where during uh, high energy needs, like if it gets real hot in LA, they will pay us to get power from our battery. So we make like $2, wow. uh, what are the units? <laughs> Kilowatt hour, hour per fortnight, as I like to call it. Um, I'm not, I don't even for, try anymore. For long per per <laughs> for, for long per, uh, per per quadrant. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so we get paid two bucks, where our power is normally like twenty six cents for that same unit of energy. So we actually we've made like oh, sixty dollars wow. so far this year. So twenty thousand <laughs> wow. dollars in batteries. We're 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 burning that. We're we're making it. So back to the troubleshooting <laughs> note. It, you you tried to blame yourself and say it was embarrassing. I mean, it was embarrassing that it wasn't the solar people's fault. But from the big picture, I feel like there's a little too much to know. I mean, you and I are reasonably clever people, reasonably well-educated in this nerd stuff, right? We're pretty <laughs> good at it. Um, I don't know if you do. for the power, the power unit things. I don't the do units. the power unit stuff well no. either. Well, yeah, they right. shouldn't yeah, put, units are tough. <laughs> they shouldn't have put the word hour in something that does isn't time-based. That's why I can't ever do it right. <laughs> um, but but as much as we know, and Steve and I are, you know, controlled experiments, man. We we change one thing at a time. I document, he doesn't document, but I document, we change this, this happened, we change this, this happened. And it still took us four months six months to figure out what was wrong yeah. with our network, that it was a, yeah. a dodgy power supply. Yeah, no, it's really true. And, you know, I, it hits me a little bit more with some of the computer, you know, the Mac and iPhone stuff where, you know, like my parents or my in-laws will, will have some problem. And I'm just like, I, I know the answer to this because of who I am. And mm-hmm. I can solve it in 30 seconds because of that. And you would stand no chance. <laughs> just not like, you know, you would, you would never solve this problem. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like you could, you, it, it's, it's not possible. And, and it's funny because it goes back to the, um, you know, I, I got started doing this stuff in the, you know, the mid eighties, uh, working with computers and started to bits in, in early nineties, 1990. And we always sort of believed that like we we're evangelizing technology and, you know, that, that if we worked at it, it telling people how to use it, we'd all get better at it and technology would get easier and it would be become really, it'd be widespread and everyone, like the world would be good. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we were young and naive. <laughs> um, but but I, I kind of believed that for, for, for a long time. And, and at some point, I actually did an article in Tibbets about this. This is quite some while. While Google did these videos uh, in Times Square. I can't remember the details. It was something like, what's a browser? Um, or something like that. Or, mm. And, and they were just asking, like, you know, it's like person on the street interviews. Um, and, and it was absolutely eye opening, the level to which your random person in Times Square couldn't even begin to answer this question. Right. And, th- and this was a while ago, but but still, the, the internet and the web had been around long enough that it was not, it should not have been surprising. They were all using one, put it that way. Right, right. Um, and, and it was that, I remember, I have to look up this article now, because I remember, I remember, it's like, I realized that, no, there's always going to be geeks. <laughs> you know, that there are going to, you know, that, that, that there really are people who are good at tech and people who aren't. And yes, there's lots, everyone who's, who isn't good at it is still going to be using it. But they're the people who only learn how to do something when their friend shows it to them. And, and I, I, you know, I think and, there's and, a... There's yeah. a, a second quadrant. It's not just uh, it's not just left half, right half. Get it, don't get it. It's want to get it and don't want to get it. So it's oh, it's it's a Absolutely. it's a four yep. square, right? Because there's people who yeah. don't want to get yep. it and aren't good at it. There's people who don't want to get it, but they could. 
They just don't want it. Yeah. That to them, this is just yeah. a tool. They don't want to know how the hammer was built. They just want to know, I'm going to go hit some nails. Is this yeah. going to work? That's all they care about. And in fact, I think when people like us talk too much to them, they want less and less to know about it. You know, <laughs> like I'm never putting an IOT device in my house ever in the ever because of what the story you just told me of how long it took you to fix it. And you know what you're doing and I don't care. Yeah, right. <laughs> the other and, it, and it's funny because you can't always identify them either. So for instance, I have an aunt who's, you know, she's, she must be 70, I think just about. And, um, and, you know, but she is, you know, and she, she, she talks a good game of like, Oh, helpless little me. I don't know what to buy. Can you help me get this or help me set this up or whatever. And every time I do, I'm like, you're actually really good at this. You know, like, <laughs> you know what you're doing. You're just playing the kind of like, you know, uh, uh, not really like, not that I'm a dumb blonde kind of thing, but like she's playing the I need help yeah. card. Now, does she um, know she's playing it or is she playing it for a reason that she thinks she's not good at it? Don't know. Um, but it really is a situation where um, I suspect there's a little bit of she knows she's playing it because she's, she was a, you know, a very high level professional um, okay. before she retired, you know, okay. so like, it's, it may be a little bit of an act of being a, a woman in a high level, high level position of sometimes this was a useful game to play. The reason I ask is because I have known people where as I'm, I'm watching what they're doing, I realize they, they do know a lot and I'll never forget my sister-in-law. I said, man, you know what, Linda, you're, you're a geek. And she went, oh, am I? And it was, it was wonderful because she actually, I think she thought that she kind of knew what she was doing. And then she was really emboldened that I would give her such a compliment. Yeah. And that's when I realized yeah. that is a compliment in our world. Um, <laughs> but I, mean, I remember one of my favorite people of all time is a guy named Harry. He was um, 93 when he passed away. And I, I think I met him when he was in his mid to late 80s. And uh, I remember he was, we were hanging out watching a soccer game and uh, one of my kids and he said, uh, Hey, so Allison, can you explain what this whole thing is about screen resolution? <laughs> I did not expect that That's to right. come from him, you know, and, and <laughs> but he was genuinely curious and wanted to understand. And this was somebody who maybe wasn't yeah. terrific at technology. He was actually, what was the, the TV box you could get that like you hooked a box to a TV and you got uh, internet on it, like home TV or something oh. like that. You remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wanted to say TiVo, but that's not quite right. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It was Web TV. Web TV. Yeah, you had a Web, web TV. TV box. But Neuron was... fired. Neuron <laughs> fired. <laughs> web TV. Yeah, impressive. Yeah. So, um, but the yeah, it, it's really true. And and so so yeah, so I, so it, it was it was a little bit sobering to come to this realization that there's always going to be a role for people who are good at it and find it interesting and enjoyable to solve the puzzle. Like, I don't need to do Sudoku or Wordle or whatever. I got networks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I do like thinking about the, uh, the troubleshooting and the steps that we go through. And I think of all of the things that I do troubleshooting on the networking stuff. Like you said, uh, when Tanya's like, Hey, the network seems slow. And you're like, yeah, you can spend the rest of your life trying to figure that out, or you can go, huh, maybe it'll go away. I'm just going to wait. And, and sometimes it does. So, yeah. And we just had another one, actually, uh, just yesterday. In fact, um, people were visiting and um, Tanya's computer, uh, Tristan was using Tanya's uh, studio display so with his computer. So he'd unplugged it from her Mac mini and she'd turned off her UPS and things had gotten unplugged because you didn't want the lights on when people were sleeping in the room, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. you had to kind of reconnect all the cables. And I think Tristan had reconnected some of them after he was done. But, and, and so basically everything was turning on, but there was no, no, no video signal. Hmm. And, and, uh, and, and it was like, it's all connected. I can see, you know, like the, here's the Thunderbolt cable going from the Did back of the display to the Mac mini. <laughs> Well, you got the little a little bit of light when you turned on the power to the studio display. It, it says it's dots in the middle, um, and so it clearly was getting power. And it wasn't until I, I I looked at it more closely 
that I realized the studio display has one Thunderbolt display and three USB-C ports, <laughs> which are identical except for this tiny little lightning icon over the one, which on you can back. barely see because it's on the back. Yeah. <laughs> and Tristan, Tristan had inadvertently, just probably just not all really in. thinking about it, but they plugged in the Thunderbolt cable to one of the USB-C ports, and then it wasn't, you know, it doesn't carry video to, to the studio display. So a very easy fix. But it took us a good five to eight minutes or so before we'd like worked out all of the things going on. And like she knew this had worked, you know, two days before. So like so it's it had not to. like something could have broken. Right. Yeah. Um, but but again, you know, not a not an easy thing. And I could I could really see that throwing someone. I used to we had an elderly neighbor who I was helping before she moved to an assisted living place. Um, and uh, and she often wanted me to come over and just like put connect cables. Mm hmm. Because she, and, and she, it wasn't like she didn't try, but right. she didn't have enough of an underpinning to know of like what's input and what's output, that kind of thing. She just like plug things when they seem to fit. And uh, <laughs> I have and a blog so, post yeah. entitled just because it just because you can plug it in doesn't mean it's going to work. <laughs> and it, it was something <laughs> along those lines. One of my favorite times with Steve's mother was um, uh, Steve's mother is actually really good at tech stuff. And she'll try. And Steve's dad is the other way around. He takes a lot of hand holding, and and it's I call dibs on helping mom. Steve helps his dad. And uh, <laughs> they she we had ordered a new uh, airport extreme for them. This is many years ago, and their old one was failing. And and she got it, and she said, "Okay, when can you guys come down and put it plug in?" And I said, "You're gonna do it." And she's like, "What?" Okay, so I had her tell me, like, "Okay, what color is that cable? You know, is it is it the pink or is it the blue? Is it the yellow? I want you to pay attention. Write this down. Where is this one plugged in?" And she was she was probably in her uh, I don't know early to mid seventies, and she's crawling around under the desk, and she plugged it in, and then she I had her walk into the room where her husband was with her laptop in her hand, showing that it was on the internet because she had it on Wi Fi for the first time, and it was like this big glorious moment. So that's somebody who doesn't know a lot, but is willing to try and is pretty good about, you know, describing to you what's going on so that you can yes. help them. That, that's the other thing. That, Some people aren't good at telling you what's wrong. It doesn't like, like me. It said something. Like, it said something. <laughs> like, well, what? <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the, one of the things, I, I, and people suck at this, but I, I, I love trying to get people to take screenshots. Yeah. You know, like you don't have to, you don't have to remember, you don't have to write it down. You can just take a screenshot. Yeah, mm -hmm. then show me the screenshot, and I will undoubtedly know what you're talking about. Yeah, but if you just, uh, my, you know, my father is, uh, is that way. That he has he has terminology issues, mm -hmm. um, so like he can describe what he's seeing, but not in terms that you will be able to figure out because yeah. um, they're just different from what you're expecting. And so, so you know, like there's a lot of the kind of translation of the oh, you mean the dialogue, not the window, the menu right. bar, you know that. Steve's dad so, goes the so other way. He types into an email every single thing he saw on screen. I mean, no matter what it was, it could be his bank statement was up and he's going to tell you how much money he has, but whatever it is, he's going to type everything. So you have too much information. Um, All right. So there is something I'm going to be curious about. So one of the new Apple intelligence features coming in iOS 18 and I and Mac OS 14, 15. Uh, actually, I don't know if it's going to be in Mac OS. Interesting question. Theory is in theory going to know about Apple, how to do stuff, tech stuff. Hmm. And I assume that Apple is basically training it on the entire Apple knowledge base. Uh. So you can, you can ask Siri, for instance, you know, like, how do I hide photos, you know, hide images in my photos app? And it will tell you about the hidden album. Yeah, you know, which is not something you're going to figure out any other way, right? You know, right. like, you know, that's that's not something that's going you know, to necessarily, right, non-obvious stuff. And so I will be curious to see, and this is probably going to be one of those features that doesn't ship till 2025 or whatever, because I think the, the fully capable new Siri is, is on the far end of the Apple intelligence stuff. Um, I will be curious if that actually helps with support loads for people who, you know, people can be trained to ask Siri. So and if, if the AI is good enough language, to their terms. Natural language, right. not necessarily knowing the, the real terminology. Yeah. Because I know what theory, I'm going to do it for. You know, I'm going to yeah. do it for system settings. <laughs> you know, where did you bury <laughs> it today, Apple? Put? 
<laughs> what did you call it? Oh. Now, they have to keep using oh. all of the terminology they ever used. One of the things I was complaining about recently was in Apple Contacts, I was talking about, I was going to explain to somebody how to make groups. And I, I was looking, I couldn't find the groups menu. And I realized, because they changed it to call it lists. Okay, I'm all right. I'll go into lists. And then I go into some other menu and it's called groups again. <laughs> okay, you have to keep all the words you ever call this in the in the system. You got to keep <laughs> calling things bonjour, okay? <laughs> yes. Well, again, in theory, if it's trained on the whole knowledge base, you know, and then tweaked such that it prefers newer things, for instance, yeah. it should be able to do that kind of stuff. So if it, so, if it knows about uh, archived report, like words like system preferences, yeah. but it'll yep. drive you to it. Uh, and it yeah. should know what OS you're running. So if you're still on Mojave. Yeah. 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 Oh, but no, so, it won't. It won't have yeah. Apple intelligence. Never mind. They can start forward a little bit. <laughs> That's right. It won't know. It won't know that. It only it only knows Sequoia. Yeah. But but you could ask it in 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 Mac OS. You know Mac OS ten point. Which one was Mojave fifteen? Nobody knows. I don't. I can't remember. I can't remember anymore. <laughs> um, too many far back. Uh, I only go to Big Sur. Um, but yeah. So in, you know Mac OS eleven Big Sur. What is the case? You know, in theory, it should be able to do that. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting to see if it can do any better. I don't know if it'll ever tell us that uh, you push the wrong button on your UPS or the power supply cable is <laughs> failing on your Eero that you're not even looking at. Oh, you, I, that was the other thing I want to say when you were talking about screenshots. The uh, I first had my house uh, sitter and uh, his dad come over and take a look at the network to figure out what the heck was going on. And they took a picture of everything in my electronics cabinet area but it was a still photo and I didn't notice there was no light on the Euro. So all that had to happen was unplugging the Euro from the UPS and plugging into the wall and the network came back up. A lot of other stuff was still messed up that we had to fix, but at right. least there would have been a network pipe into the house that I could have gotten to. But because he took a still photo and I think the lights happened to have come on on the, on the Synology. So I was like, well, the Synology is up. What could be wrong? So here's a question. If you have the whole house battery, which presumably switches very quickly, why do you use UPS at all? I don't know. And in this case, it hurt <laughs> us, right? I mean, big, big surge protector power strip? I don't know. And I, I yeah. think I know, it's, it's supposed to have a surge there should protector, be no, too. But again, if you're on a battery, there should be no surges. It, would be, it, would, it definitely gives you a big power strip, yeah. but you could get a $15 power strip. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's just sort of, well, cause it's what you do, you know, we did have a, a, a big so, power surge in the, uh, I don't know if I think I've talked to this, you about the story before about how we suddenly had uh, 200 volts on one side of the house and 40 volts on the other side. That's, that seems wrong. Yeah. It, it didn't work out very well, but every single device that was plugged into one of those little $8 surge protectors that we got from Costco Every single one of those devices survived the power problem. Every single big yeah. device that wasn't plugged in one of those failed. So we lost our oven. <laughs> we lost our garage door opener. That's a little hot tip. Oh. Put your garage door opener on a, on a surge protector. Just screw it into the ceiling. Just plug it into that because we lost a garage door opener because of that. Yeah. And that was before you put in the whole house battery? Correct. Correct. Yeah. 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 So, so I don't, what I don't know That's a good about question. the whole What would have happened in that, though? Because we didn't lose power. We might still have gotten 200 on one side and 40 on the other. My suspicion is, is again, I don't know how the batteries are, are exactly connected, but I mean, sort of the way my understanding of UPS is, um, and there's different varieties of them, and I, I would have to go back to the research to that, but at least some of them, you're always actually running from battery. Oh. And the battery is always being recharged. And that's how they get around the surges, because the battery is never going to feed you more. Okay. Um, I, I think that's the, the slightly more expensive ones. Yeah, and that's that's the question is is because you have what Tesla Power Walls? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the question is the Tesla Power Walls. Um, basically, are you always running from battery and and then charging them on the back end? And if that's true, then yes, it would protect you from the surge. And in theory, there should be no there'd be never be a drop when you lose power. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's the other way around, if, if there has to be a switch, cause that's some of the UPSs switch very fast. Right. 
so that when they lose power, they notice and in milliseconds switch over to the battery. So I do hear. And so that in theory, I'm, that's enough. I've got a UPS under my desk on on uh, the Mac setup. I've got my office here. And when we have a power glitch, I hear it click. So apparently the, ba- Ooh, the external battery isn't picking it up as quickly as the UPS is. That would be a, that would be it's possible. It's just it's either not installed that way or not designed that way. I just don't know. Yeah. Um, whether how yeah. the how the battery whole battery ones, and it's possible that because um, I, I remember a couple of years ago we had some some of the one of the Helco guys here when we were fixing something, and he was like, "Oh, did you do you thought about putting in a like a whole house surge protector?" And I was like, "Well, no, because I have UPSs on on everything." More or less, and I had so before I'd heard your story, um, so I never really, never really imagined the concept of 200 volts, you know, going through everything. But, uh, um, but so yeah, so that, that was that got was the thing, first thing that got me thinking about like, well, how does the power come in in different ways, and what would that do? And so yeah, so again, not really knowing much about power, um, I, I I think there are different ways that it can be set up, um, but they probably are more or less expensive too. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been fun talking about this. Now, this started out as a a troubleshooting story, and uh, your your basic uh, message was don't assume. Yeah, and is it plugged in? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, but your stuff was it's plugged just, in. It, it was, was plugged, plugged in. in. It also wasn't turned on. <laughs> it's a, it's the it's it's the subtle. Is it plugged in? Well, yes, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, it, so. verify that assumption that plugged in means plugged in. <laughs> I was just hearing, oh, I think yeah. it was uh, Adam, Adam Christensen was talking on the MacCast about how he's got a dodgy outlet where his Eero is plugged in. And it, it's so dodgy that if his, uh, if his robo vacuum bumps it, it knocks it out. And so he'll just lose internet because the vacuum has been going around. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, so I think there's a root cause you could work on there. You know, maybe an electrician yeah, ought to yeah. be coming out fixing that. Yeah, that that's, that feels a little tricky if the Roomba can take it down. But <laughs> and then is it doing it on purpose? <laughs> Just say it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's a perfect place to close this out on a line like that, Adam. <laughs> if people want to find you online, they go to tidbits.com, correct? That is indeed correct. And uh, all sorts of stuff there. Uh, working on some new articles right now about the new network utility. Ooh, that sounds that's just fun. a tease. There yeah. you go. All right, well, we'll talk to you again on the other side of Africa. Oh, well, have a great time, and uh, let me know if you see any penguins. There are penguins there. You just have to go I, looking for them. In, in Cape Town, we're supposed to get to see them. We saw them in Ecuador and, of course, in Antarctica, so that'd be our third penguin. Adam's pointing at the penguin in his room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, and we'll, we'll talk to you again in uh, September. All right, enjoy. Well, that's going to wind us up for this week. Did you know you can email me at allison at podfeed.com anytime you like? If you have a question or a suggestion, just send it on over. I don't know how many emails I'm going to answer while I'm on vacation, but don't be surprised if I do. Remember, everything good starts with podfeed.com. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeed.com slash Mastodon. If you want to listen to the podcast on YouTube, you can go to podfeed.com slash YouTube. If you want to join in the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash Slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocilla castaways. We just had somebody new join just because they were going through the programming by stealth uh, class and they wanted to ask a question. So you can join it for that reason, too. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation like George from Tulsa at podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, you're going to have to wait until September 8th to join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.